Okay, let's make a start. Um, for those of you who are just joining, uh, my name is Neil Jacobs. I'm the head of the UK Reproducibility Network's Open Research Program. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this UKRN webinar, one of our monthly webinar series. And this one is on reproducibility, um, positionality and transparency. By joining this webinar, you're agreeing to abide by our code of conduct. And I'm just gonna put a little link in the chat there as i say broadly speaking that is be nice to each other be respectful and inclusive and of course we all will be um, this webinar i'm really excited about this this comes out of conversations that we've been having that i'll say a little bit more about in a minute but also an event that we were delighted to um, co-host with the practice research advisory group and with the british psychological society and you can see a link there to a recent report from that event and some thoughts and reflections around it, uh, looking at aspects of rigor, reproducibility, positionality for psychology research and for arts practice research. And this is part of a conversation that we're having at UK Reproducibility Network about you know, what, what we mean by those sorts of concepts across a wide range of disciplines, research fields and settings and so on. So I'm really delighted to be able to welcome uh, Andy Tolmy, Nick Fells, Seb Oliver and Matthew Hanchard, who um, going to be talking for five or ten minutes each uh, about research from from their particular perspectives and these topics. I'm going to open us up with some few uh, introductory remarks and I'm going to now see if I can share my screen to do that. So yeah we're going to have a few introductory remarks uh, from me and then we'll hear from Nick, from Andy, from Seb and Matthew and I'm going to leave them each to introduce themselves if that's okay with each of them uh, and then we'll have a short coffee break of uh, five ten minutes or so five minutes probably and then I hope we'll all come back and be ready with some questions and points and comments for a discussion which will lead us up till just before three o'clock so that's the plan for the webinar I hope that's okay with everyone uh, so yeah, please save your questions up for the discussion at the end. We'll skip through the presentations reasonably uh, promptly um, in the first half of the webinar. So with that, let's crack on. Uh, so a few introductory remarks from me. The so, UK Reproducibility Network and Reproducibility Transparency and Positionality. Now, clearly we've got the word reproducibility in our name. And we've been thinking quite hard about what that means. UKRN arose, I think it's probably fair to say, from things like the reproducibility crisis in psychology and the life sciences. Uh, that's where a lot of uh, the early energy for the network came from. But we aspire to and are increasingly uh, finding ourselves a much more, uh, much bigger uh, consortium, alliance, if you like, uh, representing a much wider range of research uh, fields, types of research. And so we've been thinking over the last year or so about what we mean by reproducible research. And this is what we've come up with. This is from our terms of reference as a result of various conversations we've had over the last year or two. So this is, uh, we define reproducible research, research that is sufficiently transparent, someone with the relevant expertise can clearly follow as is relevant for different types of research, how the research was done, why it was done like that, the evidence that had established the reasoning and judgments that were used and how that led to the findings. And I want to just want to step through because we haven't, you know, we've chosen these words in a sort of quite a considered way. Um, and I just wanted to highlight some of the, the thinking that's gone on behind some of those. And it may be, or it may not be, that some of these th sort of thoughts are reflected in some of the things that uh, Andy and Nick and Seb and Matthew will go on to say. So what do we mean by sufficiently transparent? Well, we've got a big focus in the UK Reproducibility Network, as many as you, of you will know, on open research. And the, the mantra there is as be as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. Much research can't be completely open for all sorts of extremely good reasons. Um, but what we're adding in here, I think, is something about being as open as necessary and that there is a, a degree of openness that is necessary in order for us to think of research as being reproducible that uh, is sufficiently transparent that somebody can follow it and can trust the, the findings coming from it. Someone with relevant expertise and what we want to imply here is that 
our notion of reproducibility does impose responsibilities on users as well as on producers of research. So you can't expect, you know, research is something that's complicated, it's difficult, you take years and years to become a good researcher, and you can't expect to be able to follow research necessarily in the way that we're suggesting here, unless you make the, you know, have the relevant expertise. Um, and of course, as relevant for different types of research, and there's all sorts of ways in which that will pan out and look and feel differently in different sorts of research. And there's a, um, epistemology, methodology, ethics, practicalities, all sorts of reasons why that's going to be the case. I'm not a philosopher of science. I'm hoping there are some on the call because they will be able to make really interesting contributions to this, this conversation. Um, how it was done. Now, what we mean by this is that there is a full and honest account of both the methodology, as in study design or the research design, and the methods, the particular ways in which the research was done. And that it was written at the right time. Now, clearly, for quite a lot of research, there are accounts of the method and methodology done before the research happens when you're applying for grants, for example. That is an account of the research and how you're going to do it. Um, and in, in some other disciplines, pre-registration is, is a common thing. So you would pre-register your study design. But from a lot of research, the method, the methods, the, sorry, the account is uh, written and published after the research as a journal article or a monograph or something of, of that kind. And there are interesting questions about when the right time to write and publish an account of the research might be and, and why it might be at that time as opposed to any other time. And you know how that contributes both to um, reproducibility and transparency, but also positionality in some ways. Uh, why it was done in that way, and, and clearly these are going to be justifications based on the executive practice within your disciplines, both um, ethic and, <clears throat> and ethical considerations, but also positionalities. One can imagine, for example, uh, research that's um, being led by a university in in the UK, and but is conducting field work in a country in a poor country, a resource poor country or a context. And that would need to justify the ways in which that study was designed in ways that were very conscious of the positionalities, the power differentials, the differential access to symbolic and, and economic resources that were implied in that piece of work. But you can also imagine positionalities in other ways. So for example, a researcher that spent 30 or 40 years developing a career and a reputation and prestige based around a particular theory or set of axioms or a particular approach to research might well be quite committed to that particular approach to their research field. And that is a positionality that they may well want to or need to reflect on and in, in the way that they then uh, want to design uh, a particular piece of research. Evidence that it established, now, we use evidence, we could use data, but we haven't used the word data quite deliberately because quite often in some subject areas, the word data is not a, a commonly used word. It, it doesn't really mean the sorts of things that we might want it to mean in those sorts of uh, research fields. So we've used the word evidence and we've used the word established. Now we thought initially that we might use the word gathering and putting together evidence, collecting evidence. But after conversations with, with some researchers, we've used the word establishing because that means not only those things, gathering, collecting, and so on, but also curating and annotating and, and configuring the, uh, the material such that it acquires the status of evidence according to the norms of that particular discipline. And that acquisition of that status of evidence is, um, is an important aspect of uh, you know, explaining how it was that uh, this was uh, evidence that could be referred to in in the um, in the research account, the reasoning and judgments that we use now in many you know, in quantitative research this could be uh, software-based analysis pipelines, um, but in other subject areas it could be interpretivist reasoning, it could be based on text exegesis, uh, it could be a whole range of different um, kinds of uh, approaches to reasoning, deductive, inductive, abductive reasoning. Um, so there's all sorts of ways in which we might think about what what is done with the evidence and why it is done in, in that particular way. And then how all this was led justifiably to the research findings. And that clearly refers back to the particular epistemologies and judgments and so on that, is, that were implied by the way that the study was, was set up. So our understanding of reproducibility, I think, 
is the ability for, as I say, someone with the relevant expertise to follow and in a sense in their mind re re-establish re and redo the research um, because they've got sufficient information and, and sufficient understanding of the way that it was done in the first place. Now that could be interpreted in some disciplines as you know actually redoing the study with the same data and using a, a piece of software and that might be computation of reproducibility but it needn't be that that is one way in which we can think about reproducibility among many and we're really pleased that uh, the house of common science and innovation Te uh, science innovation and technology committee produced a report of an inquiry last year uh, into reproducibility and research integrity and, and that concluded or at least, um, developed an understanding and a definition of reproducibility that you can see on the screen here the researchers have been sufficiently open to allow for robust assessment of their works data methodology and conclusions and through that assessment their research has proven to be thorough and accurate and that seems to me pretty much in line with the kind of thinking that we're doing at the UK reproducibility network and that was quite gratifying to see that so that that's just a bit of background the kind of thinking that we've been doing at the UKRN about some of these subjects and I hope that was interesting and uh, a useful framing for some of the discussion that we might now have and at this point, maybe I could turn to Nick Fells to give us uh, uh, an account from the practice research perspective. Thanks, Neil. Um, and uh, thanks for uh, having me uh, here today. I'm just going to try to share my slides. I hope this works. Can everybody see that? Yep. Good. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so yeah, my name's Nick Fells. I'm Professor of Sonic Practice um, in Arts at the University of Glasgow in the School of Culture and Creative Arts. Um, I am primarily a musician and composer and sort of sonic, sonic artist type person. Um, and my research is practice-based research. And I'm chair of this body called Practice Research Advisory Group UK. Um, and I'm here, I think, to speak about um, how these ideas of reproducibility and transparency and positionality affect and intersect with our kind of disciplines and our uh, type of research that we do. So I'm going to sort of try to whiz through a few basic um, aspects of this kind of research. So what do we mean by practice research? Um, this usually means research where practice of some kind is integral to the process of investigation. Um, uh, the methodology or the output in arts usually, but not exclusively, this means a practice of producing a cultural product like perhaps a film or a performance or an artwork. Um, normally this kind of research involves what um, Robin Nelson calls the imbrication of theory within practice or a, a praxis where ideas and hypotheses um, and sort of uh, notions projected forward experiments uh, and so on are embedded into an artistic practice um, uh, which is centered on the, the pr production of, of a cultural artifact. Um, Hazel Smith and Roger Dean refer to what they call an iterative cyclic web in relation to this kind of research. So this is an approach um, that accommodates practice-led research and research-led practice, creative work and basic research in a temporal structure that is both cyclic and web-like with many potential points of entry, transition and exit, and with repetition and variation at the core where each iteration generates alternative results. Uh, this kind of research, um, this sort of iterative research, perhaps favours, again, returning to Robin Nelson, what he calls open-ended lines of inquiry over the positing of direct research questions. Whoops. Um, so this is a form of research that's quite common in fields like mine, such as music, uh, theatre, dance, film and screen studies, creative writing, visual art, design, architecture, games and gaming, etc. And it shares some common ground, uh, perhaps, with um, participatory action research through engagement with communities in art making, where storytelling, photography, exhibition making, music and other arts practice might be used to explore identity and self-expression. 
Um, although practice research is generally a little bit wider than that and sort of refers to quite, quite a wide diversity of approaches, actually. Um, so what about these notions of reproducibility and transparency and positionality? Well, these words throw some problems our way. Um, many practice researchers in the arts also work professionally or are deeply embedded in creative industries contexts beyond HE. And in quite a lot of cases, that's sort of the way that they would, well, some researchers effectively would define their position um, as creative practitioners um, rather than researchers. So they're often involved in processes of professional or creative production for those contexts, for instance, in architecture, in filmmaking, musical performance, theatre making, exhibition design, curatorship, etc. And those professional areas um, have their own needs and expectations and um, behavioural norms different to those often of the research sector. That said, the creative production process itself might embody investigation or inquiry leading to new insights, understanding and knowledge. In other words, the creativity itself can generate new knowledge and become a process of research inquiry. But this can create competing priorities, um, and this complicates these questions of um, transparency and reproducibility in particular. Um, I'm going to put forward an example here. So let's say I'm commissioned uh, to produce a cultural artefact, a composition, and I adopt a novel approach to this using a new co-design process that challenges perhaps industry assumptions about roles and responsibilities like producer, performer, composer, software designer. And this approach produces insights about creative workflows and collaboration that could be useful to other artists and cultural producers, maybe opening up opportunities in other creative fields. So the artifact itself, the commissioned work and its audience reception is what the commissioner is interested in so its uniqueness or its distinctiveness, its kudos, its cultural value, unique identity, and to a large extent, its unrepeatability, its adjacency to my personality as an artist. Conversely, the novel approach itself might generate new insights of interest to the wider community of other practitioners and producers and other commissioning bodies down the line, perhaps. So this is the research dimension. So what does this tell us? It highlights a conflict within or raises questions about reproducibility and transparency. Um, so we might ask what is reproducible in this and who would we expect to reproduce it? To what end and for whom? Is it the artifact that needs to be reproduced? Is it the process of making the artifact, even if that leads to a slightly different artifact? Is it the novel framework that gave rise to the making of the artifact? Um, and I think this idea of frameworks perhaps is, is quite important for our fields. There's also a question of what needs to be transparent as, as, um, as Neil was saying earlier, um, how much of a making process needs to be revealed and to what level of detail and could being too transparent threaten my unique position as a pr practitioner in the cultural ecosystem. Effectively, if I give away all my trade secrets, could somebody else do this work and sort of do me out of the job in terms of the cultural ecosystem as it were? And what is it that determines the parameters of these questions? At what point do we need to ask them about what we're doing um, and um, of whom are we asking them? Um, so, the example highlights this basic tension in arts practice research between practice as making and practice, practice as inquiry. And it's fueled to an extent by the idea of creativity in the arts often considered as ephemeral or mysterious, conventionally associated with notions of talent, giftedness, virtuosity, with value often attributed to cultural artifacts or experiences on that basis. Conversely, practice as inquiry, as research, 
suggests as straight talking, a revealing of the inner workings of creativity, exegesis, explaining, articulating the creative process. Reproducibility and transparency then, whilst required of research, seems at odds with some of the structures and expectations of creative practice and the creative industries. So arts practice researchers then are often wearing two hats. They're making judgments about what needs to remain hidden in the making on the basis that preserving the authenticity of the artwork is a necessary condition for comprehending its significance whilst being transparent about the process of inquiry, being open and clear about those research elements of wider applicability or that provide knowledge and insight to the field. So this is conceiving what is often a singular work process, uh, process as layered. So having layers that require privacy and layers that require transparency, layers that need to be repeatable, reworkable or openly verifiable and layers that need to remain unique, ephemeral or unseen in order for the work to function in the wider cultural ecosystem. Just to give one more example, a colleague highlighted a situation where a non-English speaking poet was writing in their mother tongue and a question arose, should they be required to make their culture transparent to an English speaking reader? Might they argue some areas need to remain obscure for the reader to properly encounter the culture of the other? The issue was raised in relation to this, that an oppressive regime was requiring their minority language to be expunged from the work in the interests of transparency, and that the work should be rewritten in a more accessible language. So transparency then, in its capacity to be used as a tool for suppression of narratives and practices that perhaps challenge prevailing orthodoxy can be a sensitive word in the context of arts practice research. Finally, I just want to turn to uh, Neil's citing of the um, House of Commons report on reproducibility and research integrity. Have the researchers been sufficiently open to allow for robust assessment of their work's data, methodology and conclusions? And through such an assessment, is their research proven to be thorough and accurate? Most we can probably agree what it means to be thorough. The use of language here again throws up questions for us in the arts practice research field about what could be meant by or an equivalent to accuracy in an area which can be in some ways defined by its messiness. Um, this would make for another rich discussion in the arts practice research area. And it's I just want to sort of reiterate that it's enormously useful for us in this uh, domain in re-examining our assumptions and our positionality in respect of what it means to be rigorous in arts practice research for us to be here. Um, so thank you. That's all I want to say about uh, this at the moment. I look forward to the next discussions and questions later on. Amazing. Thank you, Nick. Um, really um, interesting and provocative points. Thank you for those. Please be developing your uh, discussion points and questions for the, the discussion uh, after the break. But in the meantime, Andy, can we turn to you, please? Yes, yeah, second. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Um, um, so, um, um, I'm Andy Thomas, uh, as has uh, already claimed, um, chair of the uh, British Psychological Society Research Board, but I'm also a developmental psychologist based at the UCL Institute of Education. And um, I'm really just going to kind of put forward some kind of ideas which are about as much personal really ideas for engagement with open science and thinking about open science um over the last kind of eight to ten years or so um and uh these are personal positions really as much as ones which which are are uh really uh related specifically to psychology as a discipline but obviously they are informed by by the practice in uh in psychology and i, I think just to just to say before i kind of get in, into that um a big thank you to to Neil and UKRM for involving um, me and my colleagues in this in this particular strand of work. Um, I'm continually fascinated by the way in which these these ideas, these concepts, throw up different types of complications in different areas of work, and and what seem to be on the face of it, kind of you know similar kinds of ideas really turn out to be very different. So um, I, I want to talk, as I say, from from the perspective of psychology, and I'm going to 
tackle these these three concepts in in this particular order transparency positionality and reproducibility um uh because that seems to me to be a more logical way to to proceed um let me get into that and then um uh perhaps draw some further points out of that i think the first thing to say is is, is obviously that um, that I'm talking about psychology as a discipline which encompasses a, a kind of range of different methodological methodological approaches from experimentation to systematic observation to survey type research um, to interviews, focus groups, etc, with many different kinds of approaches to the analysis of data. Um, but I think um, what psychologists have perhaps been concerned with most often over the history of the discipline, is this kind of idea of being indeed scientific about something that could be subjected to uh, a, a wide range of, of individual perspectives and individual positions. So in a sense, we're almost directly posi positioning ourselves um, as, uh, in, in, as a kind of opposite end of the spectrum to what Nick was saying about arts research as where actually the kind of trying to build the common ground is really the kind of the main goal of the en enterprise. So that really kind of, interestingly colours, I think, some of the differences in perspective that come out of that. For me, and I think for many uh, psychologists, transparency really goes to the heart of, of what we mean by open science. And um, that is demonstrated very neatly, I think, in the idea of pre-registration of studies. But it's it, that pre-registration is really only one kind of instantiation of how this might actually work. So the idea, as uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is that when you pre-register a study, you provide a public statement um, uh, on a uh, various host websites for this. The Open Science Foundation, for instance, have their, have a, a site that allows you to do this. So it's making a public statement in advance about the purposes of the research, how it's going to be conducted, um, and what kinds of forms of data are going to be generated, how that data is actually going to be analysed, uh, and so on. And um, the point about that is that... Um, it prevents or at least makes it a lot more difficult to shift the goalposts after um, uh, after uh, conducting the, the research. Um, and it goes back to a point that Neil was making really uh, in his, his opening statements about um, uh, when is the right time to be transparent. And I think for, for, for psychology, the, 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 the right time to be transparent is, is fairly wholeheartedly before actually doing the research because um, what has happened uh, characteristically in the past um, in many instances and it led to the uh, replication crisis in psychology is, is people conducting research for one purpose with one set of ideas in mind, finding apparently something else and then re reinterpreting the research as if it was meant to do that. And um, I think we've collectively identified that kind of shifting of goalposts, that post hoc reinterpretation as being really one of the kind primary uh, sources of problems with reproducibility. If you don't do what you say you're going to do, then you've got a big problem later um, uh, in terms of, of actually being consistent in the work that's actually being presented. Um, and in many different uh, aspects of psychological research, um, people have argued that, that that kind of emphasis on transparency is less appropriate. So certainly in exploratory research, very often qualitative research aimed at uncovering individual perspectives and things like that, um, that the transparency is less appropriate in that context. But I think personally, even in that context, it should be possible to articulate in advance what the objectives of the research are um, and what warrants will be taken as being suitable uh, for drawing conclusions um, and doing that in advance to prevent capitalizing on just happenstance or you know, things that happen by chance during the conduct of the research. Um, so, you know, it's about it's about being faithful to what you initially intended to do in order to um, to ensure that it's being conducted in kind of, um, I suppose, rigorous fashion in the sense that um, that we are um, uh, are actually aiming to to uh, establish answers to particular questions. And we're not repurposing research um, on a constant basis, just on the basis of of opportune findings which may not be actually sustainable so i'll say more about that in a moment in the context of reproducibility um so pre-registration is a kind of example of how we might actually go about doing that but actually i think it's more fundamental than that transparency um i think for for me and for many psychologists is, is a is about how science should be conducted um 
And if work isn't conducted openly, conducted honestly, uh, with the possibility of failure, then the whole principle of science as a, as a method of generating collective understanding falls apart because it is actually then really a collection of different individual viewpoints arrived at in different fashion. And we don't know quite what we've actually got at the end of the day. So if we, we want to achieve that kind of collective understanding. And I think transparency is absolutely fundamental. So, you know, my bottom line here, science as an enterprise rests absolutely on transparency or it's no longer science uh, is, is my kind of position on that. Talking of positions, positionality. Um, positionality is um, the kind of idea of where we come from and who, where we're located, obviously, having a kind of influence on the work that we do and the conclusions that we draw. Um, and having said all that about transparency, I think it's interesting that positionality and the kind of influence of that is something which has been much less discussed within psychology. It's, it's, it's not a term, in fact, that I've often heard used. Um, what has happened, I think, over a, a period of time, maybe 20, 25 years, something like that, is there's gradually been an increase of awareness in the ways in which researchers' backgrounds and contexts might actually affect the, the methodology that they use uh, um, and you know, the, the, the data, the evidence that they generate as a result of that and how that, in, how that might affect their interpretation of that evidence as well. So I think we recognise that there is that kind of um, that kind of potential for colouring, if you like, of of the work that we do. Um, and there's now I think kind of greater willingness to acknowledge and discuss that, um, and um, uh, you know how that relates to being more transparent about what it is we're doing and where we're coming from is obviously a kind of key part of that transparency. Um, in my experience, it doesn't often go beyond the kinds of conversations that people have around the kind of edges of conferences and workshops. And it's not something which is often um, within psychology directly discussed and particularly not in, typically within the context of a psychological paper. So it's like, it's like, it's like psychologists' guilty secrets that we want to kind of uh, acknowledge that this is there but we don't know quite how to go about doing it in a kind of uh, perhaps a kind of fashion that we all feel comfortable with. Um, there are there are approaches that uh, that we could take. Um, and for instance, you know, those of us, many developmental psychologists work alongside people in education and within educational research, particularly, um, uh, you see this more often, I think, amongst more um, uh, junior early career researchers in, in education, there is a tendency to kind of try to philosophize about the position what's your what's your ontology what's your epistemology etc cetera, etc cetera. um and that's one possible way to go i think the, the the risk of that and i have colleagues who are philosophers of education and despair at some of the things that people say in this context because often it's it's a philosoph philosophical position which is stated without any really kind of great insight into what is actually involved i think a better approach for 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 uh, maybe many of us, but certainly I think for psychology is to to be aware and discuss openly the impact and limitations of perspective, but to do that in a in an open and unstylized fashion. And I think probably we need to push for that as being something which is more uh, openly espoused within journal papers as well. Um, if we can persuade each other that uh, as journal editors and reviewers that that's actually a good idea. Um, okay, re reproducibility. Um, and um, as I've kind of shown through the kind of title of my slides, I'm really kind of linking all this to open science. And I think that's, that to me is kind of fairly fundamental from, from my perspective anyway. Um, so reproducibility, and it's the reason I put this at the end, seems to me to be a, in many ways a consequence of transparency um, and acknowledging the kind of impact of perspective. But it, there's an interesting point here and, and Nick alluded to it, I think very, very clearly. Um, but, uh, but but Neil also kind of uh, pointed at, I think, in the outset, are we talking about reproducibility in the sense of the methods that we use, or are we talking about reproducibility in the context, in the sense of of the outcomes of what we're actually generating from research? And I think, as far as reproducibility of method is concerned, that's been around for you know a hundred years within psychology. People have recognised that it's important to be. To make clear statements about the methods that are being used whether they're actually accurate statements is another matter perhaps but 
uh, but certainly the, the need to be kind of methodologically in that sense transparent about what's being done but i don't think that's really what we're talking about when, in, in psychology when we're talking about reproducibility our concern really is to produce outcomes that are actually sustainable across different pieces of research and in actual fact I think many of us are, actually, are are more interested in research using different methodologies that produces similar outcomes, convergent outcomes, because then we can have greater faith in um, in those outcomes being things which we can uh, actually rely on, pay attention to in in in, in clear fashion. Um, so um, that's the reason, really, for kind of framing transparency and positionality, perhaps as the precursors to reproducibility in that sense because um whether the the, the um we can actually kind of test whether results are reproducible in that way is increased by adhering to those kinds of uh, those kinds of principles because we understand uh, the circumstances of the original research the potential ways in which those might have have impacted on outcomes we can see more clearly what the outcomes actually are and think then about whether they are actually reproducible using different approaches, maybe, or maybe using the same kind of approach in a different set of circumstances. Um, so um, it's that kind of clarity about what's being done, I think, that's really important for trying to establish whether the results are actually reproducibility in that, that, that way. Having said which, I think it is clear also that reproducibility in that sense is very much aligned with um, uh, reproducibility in the sense of generalizability. We want results, many of us as psychologists want results which we can claim have some kind of degree of universality to them. And we have to acknowledge that for many psychological researchers, that is not actually the object of the exercise. So, um, so uh, for qualitative researchers in, in particular, um, often research is more about uncovering the range of possibilities of ways of reacting or thinking about things and not about establishing their relative prevalence or anything of that kind. So it's reproducibility in that sense of the outcomes is perhaps less important in that context because it's it's more to do with establishing, uh, uh, as I say, the possibilities rather than which of those possibilities is actually operative under any given set of circumstances. Um, so it's it's a much more kind of exploratory type of approach, and we wouldn't perhaps expect to find um, such a kind of um, uh, an occurrence of reproducibility in the sense that I've been talking about in that kind of context. Um, so I think there's an interesting kind of territory there. I, I certainly a lot of what Nick has talked about in the context of, of arts practice research resonates, I think, very particularly with that kind of approach to doing psychological research that um it's that's i think probably one of the biggest points of connect uh, i'm sure there are many others but that's certainly it's i think an intriguing one okay thank you very much amazing thank you very much andy um so i'm going to move now to seb thanks let me just uh, share my slides Right. Hi. So, yeah, so I'm Seb Oliver. Um, I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Sussex. Um, in, in, this, in that sense, I'm talking um, on my own behalf. I'm not, I'm not representing astronomers in any particular way, but just giving my own personal perspective. Um, uh, I'm also um, the institutional lead at Sussex for uh, UKRN, so uh, I, I kind of have come from that, that um, background. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do is, um, I think I probably, I probably, I, well, no, definitely, I'm even further along the axis uh, from from Nick through Andy to uh, to astronomy is um, is definitely going in a, in a in a very uh, different direction. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the sort of sociology, I guess, around astronomy uh, to sort of give you a flavour of where we come from on this. Um, Talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts about what what we uh, what we need and what we have for uh, for reproducibility uh, in particular, and then and then sort of question well are we really reproducible um, a little bit, um, and I'm going to give you at the end an exemplar I think of of, of some some really good practice in the, in the field. Okay, so so what is a, what is astronomy? Often often called um, big science, uh, and that applies to particle physics as well. Um, perhaps not a very helpful term that, but but um, if I can sort of try and describe what 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 that perhaps means, I, I think 
astronomers and indeed particle physicists tend to have what I would think of as actually quite simple uh, challenges that we're trying to solve. And, and, the, and those are communally agreed, you know, that we want to understand, for example, the parameters of the universe or the laws of physics or, or how galaxies evolve. So we have quite a good common understanding of, of what questions we're asking um, and, 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 how, and the sort of evidence that we would like to, to, to bring to, to address those questions. Um, but it does require expensive uh, tools, expensive observatories, expensive facilities. Um, and so in order to enable that, we need international communities. We need to build up um, big, big uh, communities in order to justify those resources being put in. Okay, so that puts us in a very, very different space from, from a lot of research. Um, I've said I said there's some words, drivers and enablers, and I'm not in I'm, what I'm going to sort of say here is is a, is a few sort of related points. Is that because these facilities um, are very expensive, you need to get people together to build stuff. Um, one of the rewards for building stuff, like building an instrument on a, on a facility, is actually that you get some time. You get some time on the facility to do your own science. And in order to protect that, you need some proprietary period where you can use the data and, and others can't. On the other hand, because governments are paying for these facilities, they want the data to become public so that all astronomers or all particle physicists can use that data. So there's a there's a sort of tension there between proprietary and, and public data. Um, and um, I mean, that was interesting for me. I once uh, worked on a on a Japanese project um, and three U UK universities were able to join with the with the the uh, Japanese space agency on that project. Um, and sort of anecdotally, I was talking to some Americans, you know, why wasn't NASA involved in this? And, and, the, and the answer uh, that they came up with, and, uh, you know, so this is, this is somewhat anecdotal, was that um, NASA would have insisted on the data being public. Um, and the Japanese, um, were, uh, the, the, the argument was that the Japanese were, were, were less happy with that. And they were happier working with smaller groups of, of astronomers from UK universities. And, and the rationale for that was that the, the American community was massive. And so if the data was public, uh, the Japanese astronomers would not have got the reward from building things. So there is an interesting tension there between that. Anyway, increasingly now there's a move towards legacy projects, big, big projects with the data being made public. That's, the, that's very much the kind of the direction of travel. I uh, could also say something in, in a more broader context about uh, in research culture about metrics and how those have driven some of these uh, things, but I'll just bring that up as we go along. Um, so, um, what uh, you know, what what the nuts and bolts are is that we we have common data formats, and we have you know way back uh, decades. So we've got common data formats, common uh, metadata, and so on. Um, we now have a thing called the virtual observatory, where data centers, all data from all telescopes, is kind of put together, and people can access it using tools. Um, the, the snapshot on the right is kind of showing uh, one of these tools that allows you to get data from all different telescopes and to bring it together into a uniform platform and analyze it and so on and so forth. Okay, um, We've also been very much into the open access. So archive was actually originally kind of something that came out of astronomers and then uh, or an, an astronomer and was then uh, implemented by the particle physicists. Uh, and of course, the World Wide Web was uh, was something that came out of um, the particle physics uh, through Tim Berners-Lee. So kind of that sharing of kind of data and sharing of, of, of science results has always been kind of part of the DNA uh, in these fields, because, again, those common questions, that common scrutiny is always something that, that, that that's, uh, that's part and parcel of, of, of what we're trying to do. Um, and that's moving into the software. We've had common software tools. Um, we've had common libraries, uh, and increasingly, um, it's it's sort of absolutely yeah, normal for everyone to put all of their software onto GitHub and share it, and so on and so forth. That's um, that's the, the probably the latest developments. So, is it reproducible, right? Well, I guess one thing that's perhaps um, perhaps not obvious immediately is that uh, there is one sky, right? And and that that seems like a trivial point, right? But actually, it's quite fundamental because all of astronomy is about observing things. We don't take galaxies into the lab and kick them around a bit. We can't do that, right? All we can do is look at them. 
And there's one sky. I mean, if I took, came up with a theory that the moon was blue, you could go out there and you could take a look and you could go, no, it's not, right? So, you know, we've got the same sky we're working with. Nothing's behind closed doors. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no secrecy there. Um, and our results are checked and scrutinized. Everyone's got the same, the, the same common sort of goals. So we're all trying to look at that sky and to try and answer the same sort of questions. Um, and a lot of, and I'll say a little bit about this, a lot of the interesting questions are kind of like two different telescopes with two different approaches, trying to solve the same question. Do they get to the same answer or not? Right? Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, providing a lot of, of that kind of reproducibility. And of course, all the tools, the data and so on are, are widely available. Um, we don't actually use pre-registration much. It's not something we, we do. Um, and actually, I don't think there's much there's an there's, um, enormous amount of question of scrutiny of individual papers, right, of, of is this paper reproducible? I think there's a general expectation that it would be, right, um, and everyone would be, you know, horrified if they felt their results were not reproducible. Um, but it's not something that we really try and, uh, and do. What tends to happen is people will go away and try and do that, that reproduce that result in a different way with a different facility or, um, or so on. Um, but some results are going to be hard to reproduce, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain a little bit about why that would be. So if I can just really, really simply kind of explain how astronomers work. Um, so we've got the universe. We, we look at that universe through our telescopes, and those telescopes produce some data. And what our science is, is trying to reverse that and go from the data and understand what the universe is like. Okay. And that inversion process going from the data back to the universe is is the is the tricky bit right? what what what's go, going on there <clears throat> now one common way of trying to solve this is we create a model of the universe which might be parameterized it might be a computer simulation or whatever and then we simulate the process of the telescope and then say what we then create some synthetic data of what that universe would look that that model universe would look like had it gone through our telescope <clears throat> OK, and so then we can have different universes and we can have different data sets and then we can find some way of comparing that with the real data. And then we've got some idea about what the universe looks like. OK, now the problem is, is that, you know, any of our public data and our public software tools um, don't necessarily know enough about the telescope and actually the experiments that were being done that you can accurately do this simulation. OK, and so that's the bit that kind of you need the experts, the people who were actually involved in doing that to actually to actually understand that part of the process. And without that, it's it's really hard to reproduce the science. Okay. And that's something we're grappling with, I think, as astronomers at the moment. Um, there is talk about, you know, we could uh, we could publicly share the, the likelihood uh, functions of, of data right now that's a technical thing and I won't try and explain what that means so people are thinking about it but but I think fundamentally this isn't this isn't a solved problem um, but I'll give you this exemplar of some, of some really good work here um, so this is a uh, the dark energy survey so they're trying to work out the parameters of the universe which are captured in this diagram here you don't really need to know what those were so the the, the orange is some previous work, not, not by them, but another experiment. you doing this in a different way, gets this answer here. The worry is that you'd kind of keep tweaking your results until you got something that agreed with that. So they wanted to really involve, really avoid that, that, um, uh, uh, that confirmation bias. And so what they came up with is this blind approach where they, uh, they have analysts who build a pipeline to analyze the data. Uh, and to get a result out. And they keep testing that until they think they've got that pipeline working on synthetic data, and then they stop. And then there are some simulators who build different synthetic data sets in the kind of way I described, and they build many of these with different parameters of the universe. And then the analysts take those synthetic data plus the real data, but they don't know which one's which and they apply the pipeline to get the results out. So they've got results from synthetic universes and, and the real universe, but they don't know which one's which. And then someone, a third party, does know which one's which. And they look at, they look at the results that they've got, and they go, this is the true result. These are the ones with just the synthetic ones. Okay? And so that's, that's kind of, so that's all people, almost all people within the same team, okay? but they're consistently within the team, uh, developing a very, very complex and rich way in order to, 
to uh, to uh, make sure that their results are robust to uh, any any biases of confirmation bias and so on. Okay, so uh, that that was really what I wanted to say. Um, so astronomy, I think, has been open for decades, and there's lots of good practice in there. But I think it's still reproducibility is still not a solved problem, even in this this sort of area where it's arguably simpler and easier. Um, but there are some good exemplars. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, uh, uh, brilliant. Um, um, what a wide range of uh, research fields we're hearing from. Thank you, um, Matthew. Yeah, um, I'll try and share now. I'm not seeing the share. Ah, it's at the bottom, sorry. Right, so while I'm loading that up, I'll just say I am I work at the University of Sheffield. What I'm really talking about today is a project that ran last year, managed to get a small amount of money from Research England funds for their um, enhancing research cultures um, sort of scheme. And I was quite interested in looking at open data and the mandates that are emerging around it and what that would mean for qualitative researchers like myself and also like Nick coming from a visual sociological background, practice based work as well. So what I started out with really is this idea that from sort of philosophical transactions onwards, um, which is the first peer reviewed journal. We've all, always had this notion that I and that science should be open, um, normal science in any case. And it's it's steeped in a sort of enlightened ideal that we can sort of build up the the blocks of knowledge one brick at a time, um, and, until a sort of paradigm comes and knocks it all away, or until we sort of have new knowledge that takes us in a different direction. But normal science is generally one block upon another. And the openness allows us to see the logic of how each previous course has been laid. Um, so we can build on that. And it, you know, it served us very well. But science isn't necessarily static or solid in the same way. It's very hard to point at the economy as a singular entity. Instead, normal science occurs in small communities, small groups, and politics, money, funding, um, different priorities, they all shape different fields of science and different domains in different ways. So I would call that a regime drawing on science and technology studies. So for me, science is both social and technical. It's not necessarily just about an enlightenment ideal of knowledge being built upon knowledge. There's a politics at play beneath it. Um, and that plays out in policy. And um, we, we heard Nick talk about uh, at the House of Commons discussion and paper. It plays out in institutions and the pillars we set, the priorities we set. It plays out in the decisions people make on what to take forward and what not to take forward. And that gives us different landscapes. So the different, um, if you like, different regimes occur in different different places. Um, you know, as as uh, as Seb was just mentioning, the Japanese understanding of how to make science open versus the U.S. understanding, those are different landscapes that that emerge through through different constructions. So science is constructed over time, but it follows a path of dependency. So sometimes that can be legacy technologies. Sometimes that can be following particular routes into knowledge. So. Before the COVID pandemic, there was very little research funding for um, post-pandemic rebuilding. COVID-19 came along and suddenly there's a lot of funding in that field. It became important. And as we sort of trace the, the, the development of science along different paths, other paths are closed down unless somebody comes back and revisits a past technology and a niche emerges. So if you think of the put-put engine, Replace, being replaced by the jet engine, um, whether it would be slightly more economical on fuel and could have been better for the environment if we developed along those routes, 
but we didn't. We we stuck with the jet engine. So we follow these different paths, which are not necessarily objectively driven or based on any notion of of the real. They're constructed over time. And I wanted to take that forward into qualitative research to see sort of what was happening with open science and and data in particular. And to give you an example of the, the framework I've just mentioned in practice, if you think of Vannevar Bush at the top here, um, who, who is a, a very famous scientist, um, and you think of Senator Kilgore at the bottom from West Virginia, they both had a vision of how science should be funded, um, especially biomedicine, how research into medicine should be developed, you know, what shape science ought to take. And President Truman signed with Vannevar's idea that we should have a national science foundation and that public monies would fund basic science, whereas the market, the commercial market, would take its application further. Um, it's, a, it's a capitalist logic. Kilgore had a slightly different vision where you would have the state getting a rebate and owning some of the assets of the production that it had made. Different logics. We followed Vannevar. The US set up the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health. And following that through now to where we are, AstraZeneca, they profit from open science um, in developing the vaccine, took it forward to make a commercial application and pocketed $4 billion in after-tax profits. That's based on open science. So it gives us a particular model that we follow. And in open science, we've followed that quite closely too. When we've moved on to open um, publications. So if you think about uh, this particular cycles of publication now, if you're in the UK, for example, you most likely have block funding at an institution. You apply for that. That block funding goes away, pays for the um, process fee for the article to be open access. It then goes through a process of being re reimbursed. It's quite a long, arduous process. But we have a particular regime that's emerged around open access publication. And, you know, that's been pushed forward by a memo by the Office of Science, Technology and Policy in the US. It was mandated first there. Any research with over 100 million in federal funds had to make their publications open access um, within six months. Anything over, uh, sorry, under 100 million in federal funds had to do so in under, over six months. They had a year. Now follow suit in Europe, Coalition S does the same with publications and UNESCO or 214 of its members plus its uh, affiliated countries. Publications across those are expected to be open access. It's mandated and it's, it's good science. There are some niches that emerge within that. So you've got Sci-Hub, for example, illicit taking of documents You've got things like ResearchGate, and I'm sure we've all been on listservs where we've shared documents where people have asked for this paper or that paper. But in general, open access publication has followed a model where it's been mandated in a particular way, along a particular logic. Um, and we're at the point now where, you know, Relics, they own our saviour and RX, they pocketed 2.7 billion in 20, so almost the same as AstraZeneca, just over half. It's quite a lot of profit. So publication is worth a lot. There's a lot at stake. Data, however, it's a sort of it's almost the Wild West where we are now at the moment with it in terms of uh, mandates. So last year, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, that's a, a presidential office, put forward a new memo the nelson memo and that meant that all research with federal funding in the us um or that received federal funding over 100 million us dollars must make its data open access within one year anything under 100 million must make their data open access they have a year's grace so just over a year now that's a big change for quality researchers you, in the US, if you're federally funded, you're going to be mandated to make your data open access by, I mean, that comes into effect at the 31st, well, the 1st of January next year. Coalition S, so Plan S across the EU, um, they're, they're following suit and taking a similar, similar move forward. 
that includes Wellcome Trust, UKRI, um, large funders, and UNESCO are motioning to do the same. So there is a move towards making open data and uh, making data open access and to mandate making it open access. I mean, we, we have had a long history of open access data in the UK. We're very good at it, but it hasn't necessarily been mandated. Really, what I wanted to look at is the, the structure around that. What sort of regime was emerging? What niches existed? And how could qualitative researchers adapt? What could we do? And I wanted to look at the politics, the practicalities and the epistemics of doing that, what it meant for qualitative researchers. Um, I wanted to see how we could actually foster a culture of open quality research. So I carried out this research um, in a small scoping survey, more for the free text. I wasn't looking for statistical um, significance. A bunch of interviews with quality researchers, workshop um, with some participants to get feedback on the findings and a literature review across eight academic databases. Um, I have got a report published, an article's in draft and I'm looking at a follow-on project. But really, that's what we wanted to look at. The key findings for that, which I'll expand on in a moment, are that there is a low awareness of open access process and resources amongst qualitative researchers um, in universities and also within GSR, so government social research, to feel unprepared to. The time and resource needed to generate open qualitative data sets just isn't necessary there. We, we don't write it into our um, funding applications to build in the time, the cost, the staff resource to do so. There's also concern over the ethics and practicalities of making interpretives to inquiry open, also practice-based, you know, um, making that open in different ways and, and the realities of doing that. So taking sort of three examples really out of that research, one, it's quite simple. It takes what we call a realist logic. They just follow the regime. So there's an onus placed on researchers adapting to the existing guidelines. So, you know, I conduct my research. It's funded by the university. The intellectual property belongs to the university. I simply make sure that it's anonymized, that it's not causing harm, and I upload it to a repository. Straightforward. Um, you tend to find people following that mode, they focus on the process, so de-identifying participants. They might identify a few new frameworks. Um, and there is an acknowledgement of methodological and epistemic diversity, but it sort of sidesteps how to deal with them. There isn't really a sustained debate um, on some of the things that Nick was mentioning, for example. They're just not there. Um, notions of authenticity, notion, but also wider politics. You know, if you're an ECR, you've been carrying out ethnography in a, a specific context for two years. That's your capital. That's your ticket to gaining full time employment. You want to withhold that. Um, the second example is it goes a bit deeper into the political contestation, which would see depositing data as a form of extractivism. So there's a data colonialism going on and they prefer the copy left process so that a university or a particular body, such as relics, isn't profiteering from data. Data has value. They, you know, it's it's monetizable, um, but with safe, sensible safeguards. But there's also an understanding of maintaining the sort of ability to reuse and to champion and preserve preserve that that sort of diversity. So having an understanding of context means we can bring in indigenous knowledges and not necessarily force a um i don't like the term western but force a particular scientific re re revolution informed vision of science onto other ways of knowing a being um the third really is this epistemic contestation that that flagged up where there were different sort of values that were placed on showing context so in my own my own research i look at rare disease patients um institutionally and through an ethics board i can quite easily de-anonymize the data um i'll even happily fabricate if i need to which is to make an ideal type it's a little like synthetic data but on a small scale and here really it butts against the notion of rigor so methodological rigor um, I mean, we talked about sustainability here earlier. It, it's really about rigor when we talk about 
what what the main core content core issue is. So we had this sort of imaginary of open quality data, what it means. And we have this inherited grammar. Um, Landy have this great term in this open as possible, closed as necessary. The data should be fair, which I take some issues with, that sunlight's the best of disinfectants. And we have a pathway that's been partly mapped. So the mandates are in place. You know, there's no taking that back. They are. Um, we have institutional processes around data management, ethics, deposition, licensing. Some people uh, are required to pre-register. Some are not. And we have particular niches. So GitHub, Research, Gate, um, you know, Sci-Hub, Listerb sharing, Copyleft, researchers withholding data. So they're, they're not necessarily stuck within the regime. There are ways around that. And within that landscape we have in the UK is that ethics focuses on anim anonymity. It's protecting the participant, protecting the data. There's a notion of context, which I would call maintaining the story of the story and how we've got to that data. And there's also a notion of ownership. Who owns the data? Is it the researchers? Does it belong to the commons? Is it co-produced with the participants? Um, who, who does it belong to? I mean, formally, most researchers' data belongs to the university they work for, that, that you know, is, is legally there. But there's a moral there as well. So the contours around that, what I'm finding through the participants' statements, really, is that replicability and reproducibility are not always suitable grounds. And here I take the older form of replicability and reproducibility as using the same methods or different methods on the same data. And I appreciate the sensitivity in, in Neil reworking that concept to see what they mean. Um, and sort of, especially the use of abductive. So we see this, this sort of unfolding contours of that landscape. We're going to see forms of research take precedence and others will, are likely to be diminished, which is a risk. Um, if you can't be open, you won't get funding. So I went through this and I sort of started toying with this notion of re-renderability. Um, as an alternative to replicability or reproducibility. So rather than having the sort of same or, or at least justifiably comparable findings or results coming from the same data or method, or taking a new data or the same method and getting, you know, justifiably comparable, something you can compare and say, well, I've done this and I've got something more like an apple rather than a pear. Re-renderability is slightly different. Um, for interpretive research, I've suggested that we should, there should be some data or at least a likeness of it. So whether that's an ideal type of your field notes and excerpts, um, it could be a video recording of a, a dance recital um, or a performance. It could be an image of an artwork, just something that gives a semblance of what the actual product or artifact is. I've noticed that there should be some detail on context where as far as possible. So that could be spatial, temporal, political, um, and also a statement on research and positionality. So this isn't just in terms of their political stance, but also the background as far as they're willing to add in. And what I'm, what I'm getting at really is not that it's that you could reproduce or replicate the same research, but rather you could understand the interpretation and the storying, how that researcher has got from point A to point B. You, and you may not be able to reproduce that, but you can understand how they've got to that point and where the rigor sits. So that's that's the notion I've introduced in in the report, really. Um, yeah, I'm quite happy to talk about that in detail. <laughs> thank you, Matthew. Brilliant. So thank you very much to uh, to Nick and to Andy and to Seb and to Matthew for those presentations. I suggest that we take a, a five minute break now. Um, while we're on the break, please put your questions in the chat while you're getting your coffee. Uh, so we've got some questions to come back to. Um, and at this point, I would simply like to uh, just acknowledge that we've got five white men on the panel and I want to apologize for that. Uh, we will uh, try not to do that again. Um, but in the meantime, let's take five minutes and uh, please put your questions in the chat. Back soon.
Right, hello everyone, welcome back. I'll just wait and see if um, our panelists are here. What's up? Have we got Matthew? Yes, we have. Marvellous. Let's crack on. Um, thanks very much again to, to Nick and to Andy and to Seb and to Matthew. Great presentations, very uh, interesting, provocative, very diverse perspectives um, in some ways. Um, although, as I said before the break, not in other ways. Um, so we've got some questions in the chat. Please uh, add your own questions. We've got um, just over half an hour, perhaps, for uh, a quick discussion. So Eric White has um, asked Nick a question. Nick, are you happy to take that? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, it's a very good point. Um, uh, I mean, there, there's enormous diversity here, and I, I can only really speak from my own practice, I suppose, because it's just too wide a wide open a, a thing, really. Um, people use all kinds of different methods and different tools and so on. Um, I mean, there's obviously, in my area, there's a lot of contribution to open source software development. Um, there's also a lot of work that goes on using sort of commercial tools, uh, commercially available software, proprietary software, um, where there are sort of software frameworks developed within those environments that themselves can be shared openly and freely. Um, but they tend not to be, they tend to be sort of shared within particular user communities. Um, and um, sort of in various repositories that are quite niche, but probably don't meet any sort of open access um, sort of formal uh, requirements and so on. So there's a lot of sort of informality around all of this in my area, in our area. And that's something, a lot of it's international, of course, so it's sort of open as well to different sort of uh, national trends you know things to do with software in the us and so on so um in in terms of the the practice work itself sort of outcomes and if you like the some of the findings of, of some of what goes on um frustratingly that can be affected massively by sort of um uh commercial contracts and and commercial license limitations so working with performing bodies, uh, commissioning bodies, you know, contracts sometimes have sort of license restrictions built in that mean that you can't actually publicize certain things to do with what I was saying earlier about the uniqueness of the product and sort of the design and so sometimes just to do with the sheer sort of labor involved from all kinds of partners and, you know, musicians and performers and so on who are all paid freelancers or paid as employees of a particular organization or whatever and they, they, they sort of you know they're bound by a limitation in what they can sort of allow out freely into the world and so on so it's it's actually very diverse i mean there are um i think in terms of you mentioned ref there and sort of evaluating all of that i mean i was on the ref panel for sub panel 33 um and and the, the diversity is just huge. The diversity of approaches to that problem is, is huge. Some things are very, very open and very transparent. Um, and other things are made available for the purposes of evaluation, but for contractual reasons cannot be made more um, more widely available, even though the, the sort of outcome of the research was effectively shared, as it were. Um, there's a lot that can't be for contractual reasons. So yeah, it's complicated. So that's a bit of a not very helpful answer, probably. It's probably too big a topic really to go into much. Um, thanks. Um, Matthew, do you want to respond, and then I might ask Eric whether or not he wants to come back on any of that. Yeah, go for it. I mean, I mean, for me, I I see the ref twenty eight twenty twenty eight. I can say it. The move to sort of uh, the contribution to knowledge and understanding, it's a bit broader than it had been in the past. And I think that breadth then gives us a little bit more scope to sort of have a broad, have a more diverse 
range of inputs and a, a, a raw range of data we could input. But I think really in terms of, you know, open access, making a broader type of data open access, I think there's a, there's a sort of, there's a sort of attempt often by researchers to try and take everything on themselves. I mean, universities are broad churches. We've got a, very, a lot of staff. We have research data management teams. We have knowledge exchange experts. We have impact experts. I wouldn't try and take that on myself. I'd have a coffee chat with somebody who gets paid to do that and is an expert in that area myself. It's just that's that's the way I would take it forward into formal assessments. Yeah, great. Thank you, Matthew. Eric, did you want to come back on any of that? Um, I, th I think actually those were two really helpful uh, responses. I mean, the, the question is deliberately um, big and open, I think. Um, uh, but but those insights are really helpful. Um, I, the, 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 the kind of context for it, I suppose, is coming from a humanities background uh, and kind of group bridging the gap um, in interdisciplinary practice between, say, for example, computer scientists who are working on open research, uh, op open source software, and on the other hand, um, creative practitioners who are very carefully guarding, <laughs> quite rightly, you know, the, the, um, uh, their 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 kind of creative content, you know, as a source of income. Um, it are I, I really recognize the tensions that I think a lot of the panelists are negotiating. So so in in framing the question that broadly, it, it's really looking about these discrete um, kind of interventions that 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 I'm seeing unfold across these different disciplines. So it is enormously helpful to get these kind of insights, um, um, you know, from both of you on this. Um, but uh, um, Matt, also, that's a really good point about. Um, you know the the kind of not necessarily outsourcing, but you know enlisting a range of expertise. Um, I, I guess the, the the final thing I, I would I would kind of put back, uh, and maybe a number of panelists can can think about that as well, is that in some ways, you know, when we're, we're generating things like rough statements and uh, particularly impact case studies, um, yes, it is collaborative. Of course, it is, but but ultimately, it has to come down to a narrative. It has to be kind of you have a grab bag of terms, a library of terms that you need to use, um, and and I think one of the things I'm I'm, I'm kind of um, uh, uh, in in absolutely no way self-servingly asking is is kind of how a lexicon can kind of emerge where where we can kind of identify the sorts of things that count as best practice, but also where we can kind of you know be a bit more humane to ourselves and not try and do everything you know and 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 try and kind of be rewarded for those things we can make open while at the same time kind of getting a realistic language for you know sort of talking about the areas where we have to protect colleagues where we have to protect artists where we have to protect, um, in some cases, participants um, uh, in ways that that, that, that can be in, held in tension with the demands of open research. Um, I, I don't know quite how helpful that okay. observation is, but but I certainly am very grateful for, for the insights that you both shared and for your papers. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm going to skip over my questions because I think I've spoken enough. Um, but uh, if anyone wants to, any of the other panel wants to come back on those questions, please do. Uh, Mercy has asked about uh, CC licenses and open access papers and that sort of thing. Does anybody want to comment on that? I'm also conscious that we may have some people from libraries in the uh, in the webinar who might also want to comment on that. No, a call for a call for more training, and I think that's probably right uh, to understand what the implications are for various CC licenses. Um, Corinne's question, um, which is a long question, and I haven't, I must confess, I haven't actually read it to the end yet. Nick, I think the first part might be for you. Yes, I'm just trying to grapple with that, actually. Um, hypothesis within practice research. Um, 
Yes, I mean, the use of terminology, I think, is uh, th this is something which I've sort of been grappling with within my own institution, which is quite a large um, institution that covers sort of sciences, medical research, uh, arts and humanities research, and, and um, you know, it's, it's pretty pretty big and wide in that sense. Um, and the the way that the the language that we use can be at odds actually across the disciplinary um arenas and um um and sometimes that can cause problems that there's sort of um you know uh the positionality built into the language so if we're using the idea of hypothesis within practice research um it's yeah probably not used in quite the same way um i think that relates to nelson's idea of lines of inquiry as well that actually the way that we articulate questions and questions about questions um, is sometimes very sort of deeply ingrained into the, the psyche or the makeup of a, a discipline or a sub-discipline or a field of practice. And actually, for me, the, the whole discussion of positionality that we've been having recently has been very, very useful for that um, in actually kind of equipping me and equipping us with ways of recognizing our own um tendency to to use terms in a certain way um um so i don't know if that really addresses the question but yes i think there are important differences in the way we use the same words sometimes yeah no thank you nick the second half of corin's question is uh, uh very interesting and i think we might all have a comment on that i actually have a, a colleague here at the university of bristol who's just finished a phd uh, and the basis of that is to um, to run sessions with researchers to enable them to become a bit more like philosophers and to reflect on the ways in which they are generating knowledge and what that sort of what the implications and, and entailments are of, of that kind of way. Um, so, do we all, uh, given the questions and challenges that we've been covering in the last hour and more, uh, need to become a bit more like philosophers? Oh my God! That's very good. I mean, I think um, uh, it's um, it's an interesting point because I, I mean, I, I didn't mean to sound damning about the, the use of philosophical perspectives in educational research. Um, the problem is that I think there is a kind of potential pitfall with over philosophizing um, work when it leads to something that I see very commonly, which is a kind of espousal of positions which are allied to some specific philosophical framework without any real kind of sense of analysis of what that actually means or implies so um so i kind of have a resistance to that kind of approach because i don't think that's particularly helpful what i do think is really helpful is not so much um adopting philosophical positions but rather adopting a philosophical stance of inquiry into what we actually do and to thinking in careful terms about about how we have generated the work that we have generated and what uh, effects that might have on the outcomes that we're actually reporting and i think being carefully analytical as far as that's concerned if that's what we mean by becoming philosophers, I think that probably is something that, that, that I think we we all need to do. Yeah, so I agree. And we're trying, you know, certainly within my own institutional context, we're trying very hard to actually um, deliver better understanding of this at both undergraduate and, and master's level. I think it's really important that this is something that people within, um, you know, the kind of early stages of exposure to a discipline are actually made aware of as well. I think that would solve a lot of problems further down the line. If I, may, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I think that the, um, the sort of rigorous critical, critical inquiry sort of building blocks, that's, that's kind of what I think needs to be, we need to sort of continually work at making sure in place because i think there's something very seductive about that idea of sort of becoming philosophers or or um you know picking and choosing bits of ideas and bits of theory um that we can use to justify bits of what we're doing i, I you know it's something which affects us i think in uh, practice research too yeah thank and um, now practically is um sort of moving slightly into Karen's question as well, is there space and time 
for that to happen? No. Um, I thought you might say that. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, how can we support them with this? I'm not quite sure what the who who the we is there. Uh, forgive me, Karen. Um, but I mean, yes, that that is a a, a big problem, particularly in certain kinds of institutions, um, particularly monotechnics and so on, which have a lot of staff um, who are sort of tangentially or fractionally uh, employed. Um, and um, yeah, the the support, the sort of research support um, for them is sometimes not uh, not necessarily. Uh, in place to the extent that it needs to be um but likewise in in other types of institute as i say we have a sort of research culture issue um where you know systems and things are put in place to serve certain disciplinary needs in certain areas but perhaps don't quite aren't quite good fit for others and that's maybe been true of ref a little bit but as matthew alluded to i think we've seen a bit of bit of movement on that which is really nice i think the question is sure. sorry go on uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I quite agree about the the, the time. I mean, I, 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 there is a, there is a high time overhead, of course, um, but it seems to me that the time overhead is 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 mostly in terms of people getting used to doing things in a particular kind of way. And once that becomes more established practice, it doesn't take up time in the same kind of way. You, you can think about this in you know using the analogy of somebody learning to drive. Learning to drive is really horrendously effortful and draining when you're first doing it and somewhere down the line it becomes completely kind of automated and you don't even really think about it very much um it's a similar kind of idea i think uh, we saw this a lot with the introduction of certain kinds of open science practices around pre-registration etc people were saying i just don't have time to do that but with a kind of newer generation of ecrs coming through for whom this is just a matter of course this is how you do it it's not something that they find at all kind of laborious in the way that us old fogies too so um i think um you know it, it there it's this an initial overhead but i think it would become less time consuming once we got used to doing it um i think the other thing that that is kind of sitting in my mind as well is that there are some simple kinds of practices that journals might encourage that would be helpful here i mean we've got used i think in recent years and many journals anyway in my context of having to make statements about the contributions of uh, different people, different authors on a paper to, you know, in terms of what they've actually done. It would be, it seems to me, a relatively straightforward job to start uh, an extension to that where actually what people are required to do is to provide some kind of brief statement about their own context and a th thinking about how that might potentially have influenced the work they've done. And that would just be there as an addendum to the paper. It would it would get us all more kind of sensitised to that. And I don't think that actually that would be too painful to introduce. That's my thinking anyway. Thanks, Andy. Seb? Uh, yeah, just agree, agree with Andy. Um, I think also that um, the, the concept of this being something in addition to the research is is one that we you know you might want to debate right but at some point it becomes actually that is part of the research they're, they're, they're one and the same thing they're not two different things um but but Matthew also made a good point which is that you know you you, pr you probably want to be doing the things that you're skilled for right and there may be people who are skilled in for example putting data onto a onto a website and that may not be your skill set so it's kind of working with the right people with the right skill sets to, to achieve the, the collective thing of making this research um you know, whatever whatever we think research should look like yeah thank you um and you know i sort of wanted to turn to you in, a, in a, another way as well so because you know in a way some of the practices that you were talking about have have been established as you were pointing out in astrophysics and astronomy for decades the the ways in which i so you know how was did that happen it didn't happen because of funder mandates it happened for other reasons yes well okay so i mean i, I sort of alluded to to why i think some of that's happened right and i think one one thing is, I mean, I, I, your question, I think, was about, you know, big, big science, lots of funding, um, lots of people. I think I think lots of people is, is clearly important, right? Because I think if you've got lots of people all trying to achieve the same thing, um, you know, we 
in astronomy, we kind of have to go to the telescopes, we have to get the data, we have to kind of, you know, we want to, you know, astronomers from all over the world want to go to the same telescope and get the same data and then be able to process it with their own software tools. So that that immediately kind of says you have to do things in the in a kind of collect in a, in a common way. You have to have the same language in which to 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 do that. Um, I think the funding, in a way, in order to produce a big facility, you have to have a big community of people saying it's necessary, right? So, so in a way, that's not necessarily part of the openness. I think that's the, that in order to get a big facility, you need a lot of people. Once you've got a lot of people, you then need that openness in order for them to do, to, to achieve that collective endeavor. Um, in any kind of meaningful way when they're all across the world and they're using all these different facilities and so on. So I think the, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a connection between all of those things, but it may not be that because it's expensive, you therefore need to make it open. Yeah, no, I think that, that makes sense. Um, Stephen's posted a question um, on research for which humans are the focus, uh, diversity inherent in human beings uh, and therefore the the assumption that reproducibility you know, is uh, a target that can be aimed for, or the extent to which that is true. I think, have I paraphrased that, Stephen? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what am I trying to say? It's the the level at which we expect that to be possible. Um, and I, I guess, so it's thinking a little bit about, say, you know, a background in psychology and, and the vast majority of psychology research is done on university students, right? Um, and then to what extent uh, are we talking about reproducibility then if we use the same kinds of populations, um, uh, that's that's some sort of reproducibility, but do we expect that then to apply to all different groups? Or um, yeah, and uh, underneath this is the assumption that something should be generalizable, and that I think itself is is um, a topic of research that that um, uh, yeah needs to be established. And so there's kinds of two two degrees of freedom there, I guess is is what I'm getting at. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I'm guessing that applies to any kind of sample based empirical research. Anybody want to pick that up? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy, happy to do so. I think it's, um, well, there's some really good questions in there, and particularly, I think, the, the question about how far we have any kind of um, particular realistic expectation that any effect we should we find should indeed be universal um and um that i think is is something that psychology as a discipline has been relatively poor at kind of addressing actually um and um you know there's various different ways you could kind of approach it i suppose there is some tendency to suppose that the um psychological processes which are more essentially kind of embedded in um in the neural architecture are things which are more likely to be universal or have some degree of universality to them. So, so to some extent, you know, for cognitive psychologists, there might be a kind of expectation that results would tend to hold across a number of different contexts. So how far that is actually explored is, is, is often, you know, not as, as, as extensive as one might hope. Um, but other types of phenomena and, you know, certainly in my own kind of, of, Field, which is really to do with you know, kind of processes underpinning learning in different types of, uh, of area, uh, particularly actually science. Um, I think, you know, there it is harder to see that there is necessarily any kind of universality and therefore that limits the extent to which we would expect or could reasonably expect results to be reproducible. So, but anyway, I mean, I think the kind of basic answer there is we should be thinking about it, but we don't really kind of know too too much about that, or not as much as we should do. There's a lot of assumptions going on. Um, I think, as far as the kind of first part of the question is concerned, I think you know the the answer in my mind is is that 
it's actually very difficult to come up with a kind of general position on that because it is so much to do with what makes sense um, as a point of connection or point of similarity within the context of a specific area of work with to people who are knowledgeable about that area of work um and so you know it's it's not easy to say that this particular level of reproducibility is what we expect to see it's 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 more it's always going to be much more nuanced than that but i do think we have some kind of particular tools in our armory i was, was talking earlier in my presentation about the importance of reproducibility of outcomes potentially as far as possible using different methods because i think you know that is the kind of approach that will tell us whether there is some kind of phenomenal whatever it, it might be that is actually something which is um at least reliably there in certain populations and that we can actually kind of start to think about why that might be the case and perhaps also make use of that um and so you know within the kind of areas that i operate uh, one of the kind of major approaches that has been, I mean, it's been there for donkey's years, but it's become something that's very much more prevalent. It's the use of meta-analysis to actually take samples of, uh, of, of research across, you know, that may well have been done in somewhat different ways, but to look at the outcomes that, where those are related and see whether there are consistent patterns that are not subject to any kind of bias in terms of publication, of selectivity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, generate a kind of better sense of how robust a particular finding an outcome is. And that tends to be typically what is kind of most influential within the field of work, fields of work related to education and learning, and most likely to influence policy as well. I mean, it's not always helpfully, but, um, but certainly there is a greater tendency for um, uh, Department for Education, for instance, to, to pay more attention to re re results which seem to be robust in the sense of standing up across uh, across different methodologies, uh, across different studies. Um, so that gives you a flavour of the kind of thing we're looking for. But, but, you know, that's often going to be driven by utility and by, you know, what what's an important kind of way of thinking about things within that particular context. It's, it's as I say, it's very nuanced, I think. Perfect, thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to suggest this might be the last question from James, and maybe each of the panelists could have a comment on how they see the role of scholarly publishers in the topics that we've been covering um, this afternoon. So, um, who would like to go first on that? Matthew, that almost looked like a nod. Well, I can do, but um, I think scholarly, scholarly publishers are largely profit driven. I mean, they say publication is theft. It's not really, but well, it is, but it's not. Um, but when really what I was talking about was publishing data rather than the actual publication itself, which I sort of separate out. So as an ethical thing, I, I tend to use an institutional repository. So my university, um, I think that still has an ethos of serving the community, serving the wider society, um, the public. But a lot of people will deposit in data sets in repositories that are not necessarily publicly funded or owned, that are commercial. And I do have... I sort of take issue on that to some extent because that does feel a little bit like extractivism but i'm not sure in terms of publications themselves we've sort of created this industry around you know article processing fees reimbursing the fees back through block funding then funders get money off government and so on we've created a whole industry that or regime that we're now now seem to be stuck within um I'm not sure what the right answer is to get around that because, uh, you know, diamond access doesn't seem to work very well, but gold access seems to be the, the gold standard. I, I don't know what the solution to that is, but for data, I'd say I'd definitely put it in the, uh, stick with putting it in the, the university repository for that purpose. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Nick? On that, I mean, yeah, I don't know about really the, the sort of universality of this, but the, the Routledge, uh, 
performance archive is is really fantastic with it with a kind of um you know curated effectively a whole kind of range of uh films um and sort of uh video studies of of particular artists and particular kind of performance projects and performance research and so on uh it's very rich so i mean in, in that sense obviously it's profit driven um but it's very rich and useful kind of archive but i mean obviously there's there are other other archives of, of stuff very much related to my field ubu web um you know has been uh was, was kind of a formative thing uh there and um um research catalog.net which is a sort of um uh europe european sort of free access open access um performance research sort of platform as it were which lets um, participants create their own expositions and kind of put together their own their own presentations of their research and get a doi for it and so on one of the key things in my field is being able to do practice research and give it a doi um, so that it becomes kind of universally searchable and sort of linkable forevermore. Um, so, so much of what we've seen in our area previously has gone into what's been called the ref graveyard, um, you know, where stuff, stuff is made, presented as research, and then quickly forgotten about after these exercises. So anything that we can do to sort of help the sustainability of visibility of um, practice research is is great from our point of view. Thanks, Nick. Um, Andy? I could say um, something. Oh, I mean, sir, go. Just, I mean, I don't know whether it's really about publishers, but about kind of how we um, produce outputs from research, I guess, is, is kind of uh, increasing that linkability and that kind of interoperability of data, of software, uh, papers, and so on, so that, so that it kind of I mean, Tim Berners-Lee did some uh, did, did a piece on. He had a kind of vision of, of five steps to open open research. I think I was trying. I'm just trying to find the link. I couldn't find it. But you know that 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 you kind of a PDF is kind of the most basic thing of being open, right? That you're just sharing the kind of words. Um, but and then as you go up, you kind of get more and more linkage of kind of the way that this piece of research relates and the data it came from the other research that's out there and so on and so forth so i guess publishers might have a role in kind of increasing that interoperability um in a way that kind of you know at the moment you can go to a paper and you can probably get a link to papers that are referenced in it right but but actually increasing that um could could be could be useful um but i but i think that you know the the move is more away from publishers and more towards open access kind of repositories and 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 peer peer led things like archive and, and like getting reviewing on archives um so, so i guess the best thing they could do is step back and, and let us get on with with, with the moving into that sort of space um but I, I don't think they'll like that one um if you look at the latest Gates um, open access policy that might influence them in that direction. Andy, you get the last word. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree totally about this being a, you know, a journey that we're embarked on. I think the difficulty at the moment is it's actually quite hard to see where we're going to get to because we've embarked on this kind of process and we're midway or possibly not even midway, maybe 25% of the way through and the directions of travel are not so very easy to see. I mean, I think the uh, advent of online open access publication, despite the flaws, which I think are many with regard to APCs and gold access, gold root open access, um, have led to an improvement in as much as there is no longer the same concern that journals used to have about page budgets and and things like that, which would constrain what they what they could publish and um, and tended to mean very frequently that that the journals would selectively kind of publish things which seem to produce be reporting striking results of one kind or another fueling perhaps some of the issues around reproducibility i don't think it's entirely fair to blame the publishers for that actually because just bear in mind that the editors and editorial boards for those journals were always academic so it was them who were really kind of driving that not so much the publishers um I think there are there are there are still many problems. I mean, I think you know one big issue is really the kind of 
the lack of any outlet outlet for for good quality research which produces null outcomes um because we you know if you're going to take any kind of process of meta-analysis seriously then we really need to know the null outcomes as well as the the positive outcomes in order to make a judgment of that and the, there are there are a few outlets that will do that but it's very very limited and i think you know everybody feels that you know if you've got null results then it's very hard to get those published um and i don't know what we do about that i do feel i suppose that the shift towards something that is more kind of um managed at the level of the academics themselves there are some beginning to be some journals that work in that kind of fashion where there are publications and peer review is in a sense a kind of reverse process where people provide commentary on on papers after the after publication and build up a kind of a critique around them um that feels like kind of quite a healthy step though how you do that at scale i don't know because nobody's got the time to, to, to be involved in that um i see a lot more kind of problems than i see answers to but i <laughs> i remain kind of basically optimistic that we are headed in a positive direction at the moment in time wherever it's going to go Amazing. All right, let's close it there. That's a great note to end it on. Thank you very much to uh, all of the panelists, to Andy, to Seb, to Nick and to Matthew, and very much to yourselves for joining us on the webinar today. Uh, look forward to another webinar in a month's time, and I should have checked out what one that was, but have a look on the UKRM website and see what, I think it might be power analysis of some form. In the meantime, have a really good afternoon, and I'll hope to see you again soon.